episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Welcome to Linux Action Show, Season 31, Episode 3. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. <laughs> hey, so uh, you ready for me to tell folks about the big show today? I am. All right. Well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, we will attempt to ascertain can a $200 Chromebook, once you load Linux on it, actually replace a $1,000 Linux laptop? Mm. Well, I've been trying it for the last month, and I'll report my results. Matt's got it right here this morning, and uh, we'll be talking about that in the second half of the show. And, of course, in the news segment, we'll talk about that big GNU TLS bug and what's affected by it and what you need to do to... Cover yourself. Mm -hmm. And also in the news segment, we're going to talk about Chrome, and they're kind of taking a dump on Linux. A little bit. I'm a little upset. A little bit. I'm a little upset. We're going to talk about that. And then also, uh, there's some a really big uh, Office Suite release for Linux. You mm -hmm. might have heard about it, the new Clearger release. We're going to take a look at the most talked about application from that suite and uh, talk about some of the cool new advancements they've made. Tell you what, Matt, Definitely. if you like uh, you know, magic, stuff. you're going to like that. Cause it's, it's, when I read it, it almost sounds like magic. Magic. And then Sorcery. Just, speaking of magic, mm -hmm. in the feedback segment, we got an email from somebody from the future Whoa. who is already commenting on the Chromebook review, which we have not yet done. What? I know. I know. Whoa. But isn't that mean if he's sending that email in now, and I've already read it before the review, I could answer those things in the review, thus creating a time paradox right here in this week's episode of Linux Action Show? Well, clearly this is something that the uh, Federation's future time task force right. is not going to be happy with. We'll just have to stay tuned and see what happens if the universe collapses in this week's episode of Linux Action yes. Show. But first, Matt, as is tradition, it is our picks this week. And uh, I, got, I got a couple of good ones for you guys. I want to start last week. Okay. Uh, we started with uh, our, our Runs Linux with somebody from the community. So one of our picks this week will be somebody else from the oh, community. Very cool. But before we get to that, mm. let's talk about this Runs Linux that probably everybody heard about this week. But we got a market right here in the yes. big show. Gabe Newell of Valve. That's right, Gabian Runs yeah. Linux. Uh, he was in. Nice. A, he was doing an AMA recently, and you can see a screenshot. That's that's his. That's his that's game so selfie. That's so cool. This, uh, he's got a full screen uh, Chromium uh, going there, and uh, he AMA says proof. he says that he runs Debian Linux on his desktop. That's his main OS. Huh? Not Windows. Hmm. Debian Linux. Very interesting. Interesting choice. I can definitely see it. He wants it to work. He doesn't want a lot of frills or nonsense. He's got a yeah. huge monitor too. Huge. Look at that thing. He's a gamer. It's that around. is that is a Pioneer Elite plasma television that he's using as his that's like a seven eight thousand dollar plasma television <laughs> they don't even, make it. Heart, they don't even build those anymore right they were uh, considered some of the best black levels in the plasma industry so good pick there Gabe. very good pick good pick uh so anyways mm. um there he is running debian and doing that's an crazy. ama which is awesome and that's makes cool. me feel good about the uh, valve's intentions he also in that uh, ama said that uh, they plan to eventually have every valve game available for linux hmm. uh, but they don't plan to do any exclusives for steam os Oh, interesting. Okay, but I'm fine with that because yeah. the main thing is that all the games will be for Linux. Right. It's good. Right. We're here. We're live today. The chair chair is currently worshiping our PC master race overlord. They <laughs> say. Hey, whatever, all hail Gabe! Know? All hail Gabe! Yeah, no kidding. Well, I'm glad Gabe runs Linux. It's, Got taste. That's a that's a good Linux user mm -hmm. to have. All right. Well, let's talk about our our software picks. But first, I want to thank our sponsor this week, and that is GoDaddy.com. Yes. GoDaddy.com is the world's number one domain name registrar, and we have a 15 percent off deal for anything you want. Now, you guys, uh, man, I got an idea for you. Now, right. I'm just okay. I'm just, gonna, I'm just spitballing. Just spitballing. Okay. But hey, Matt. Yes. What about you getting like a dot guru or a dot photography Ooh, domain? You know, these, right? they got these new fancy top level dot domains. Guru now, would definitely be a match. My wife could do the dot photography because she went yep. to school for that stuff. Yep. Well, ah. here's what you could do. Say you want to take a little money off over at GoDaddy.com. Use the promo code Go15 off too. Right. Fifteen percent off new orders in your cart. You could also use it for a dot com, a dot, you know, all the regular domains. But now the dot. I mean, I'm not huge on all these top level domains, but I gotta tell you, dot guru. I'm kind of digging that. Oh, one. no kidding, right? Yeah. I mean, like your name dot guru. I mean, pff, come on, right? Over, so go over to GoDaddy.com. Use the promo code Go15 off two. That's all one word. We'll also have it linked in the show notes if you've got brain troubles. It is daylight savings week, and I know that makes you sleepy. So you just go over to the show notes. You can click on the GoDaddy banner, and it will pre-charge your shopping session with that 15% discount. Go15 off two. And a big thank you to the world's number one domain name registrar and a recent OpenStack Foundation member. 
GoDaddy.com. You know, it'd be cool to like see which audience members come up with various creative dot gurus and maybe submit them to us, just like what you know things they're working on. That'd be kind of neat. That's right. That's right. Good stuff. I would like to see that, Matt. That'd I think that's cool. a great idea. Yes. All right. So let's talk about our desktop app pick. I was starting to say, but then I stopped myself. Is last mm-hmm. week we featured a community members runs Linux desktop. Mm-hmm. Well, this week, our desktop app pick is from another community member. Oh, right on. So, uh, last week, we talked about Q5Sys, mm-hmm. and uh, he had um, this really wicked <laughs> Runs Linux awesome. setup, right? This week, our desktop app pick comes from Michael T, or uh, Rotten Corpse, or in the chat room, mm-hmm. and uh, it is UGit. UGit is a download manager. They just released 1.10.4. It's brand new update, uh, and they're also celebrating like their 11th year of development, I believe, which is just, I mean, 11 years of any open source application That's is extremely a- respectable. Uh, and it's been a desktop app, so it's really, it's really awesome. You can go over to uh, yougetdm.com, and I'll show, you, I'll show you a little demo of it right here, Matt. All right. I just happen to have it loaded right here, right here. And did you ever use a download manager like back in the day? Oh, on yeah, back, like, yeah, both Windows and Linux. Yeah, absolutely. I used the hell out of them. So one of the awesome things that these things provide is they get it out of the browser. And even ah. today, even with even with you know broadband and whatnot, it's still really nice to have a program that can monitor your clipboard. So when it sees a .zip or a .iso, mm-hmm. hit your clipboard. It can you can go in here and you can add a new download. It will read that clipboard file and automatically oh. starts it. And the cool thing is is you can you can do authenticated logins. Oh, you no can do kidding. retries if like the download gets interrupted. You can do specific ports. You can wow. you can you can insert mirrors. You can set it to shut down your PC after it's done downloading. Yeah, this is stuff I don't recall being available on download managers of the past. I've used a few, but yeah, it's like I mean, some of them had some compelling. of these features. Right. Like here's one that or they cost you money. You know? Here's one that like here's an example of one that I've never seen from a previous download manager. Okay. Is you can import an HTML file with links to a bunch of downloads. So if you just <laughs> wanted to bang out a quick HTML file oh, wow. or a text file, even you can also do text, or you can do URLs in sequence. Now that's a bad. Even if you just want to do it manually, mm-hmm. right? You go in here. It'll you can add them all to you get, and then you can have it paused. And then when you're ready, you can just hit go, and then maybe that's when you're on Wi-Fi and you don't want to do a download over Wi-Fi, or maybe it's you're offline and you want to mm-hmm. queue something up for when you get back online, or maybe you know, I don't want to download this during the day because I want to conserve right. some of my bandwidth, but when I go to bed, I'll kick this thing off and it can, sh- it can shut down my PC when it's done. Nice. Yeah, so that's you get, and uh, it's cool because it's from one of our last producers. I love this. This yeah, is so really cool. This is I just thought over the I thought uh, post 300 these couple of weeks I wanted to feature stuff from folks who are working on the Linux Action Show who are involved, you know, Q5 Sys also works with the Puppy Linux project. He's one of their developers mm-hmm. and Rotten Corpse. Not only did he just recently redesign our last subreddit. Right. Yeah. But he's also uh, one of the developers on UGit which just had this their This is cool. Year. And I love the HTML file import. I think that's the feature that really screams yeah. at me. I well, the other this. thing you can yeah. do is like if you just like copied a whole bunch of URLs mm-hmm. to your clipboard like maybe like off of a mirrors page or something yeah, like that, like, you can actually import the whole batch right from your clipboard, too. So you don't even have to output it to a file so if you I don't want So I take my mouse to. and I just go, zink, yep. and I just do the whole batch, yeah. boom, done. I was wow. picturing, like, on the Chromebook there, because I'm all thinking about the Chromebook this week. I was right. picturing, you know, I'm out, I'm mobile, I don't have a connection, mm-hmm. but maybe I've got a whole list of stuff that I could build, and then when I get back plugged in or on my Wi-Fi, sure. I fire this thing off. And the other thing that's nice about it is you can close out of your browser or you're insulated from a browser crash. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's command line tools to do that. In fact, uh, you get can integrate, uh, if you go uh, to plugins, it can actually integrate with Area 2, which oh. is a very nice download manager. And so there's, it could actually work with some of the command line tools as well. And, you, and then when you do that, you can set um, speed limits. Oh, that's cool. So you can cool. say, don't, don't download more than 800 kilobytes a second. So You can't do that in your browser. So basically, it's embracing the command line, not trying to deter you from using it. Oh, yeah. It. It's, it's really integrated cool. with command line tools. Yeah. And it gives you a few extra options that you just don't get in the browser. I like it. And it's free and open source. And by the way, they're also doing a donation drive right now. I have a link to that in the uh, show notes. Is you get dm.com you get Very dm.com cool. and if you want to donate it's you get dm.com slash donate nice so there you go good job yeah. rotten i love it i thought it, i was pretty impressed i was checking it that out over cool. the weekend and, and i uh i downloaded the latest uh, iso of integros and yes. i'm gonna definitely have to check that out when i get home i I, th- I think that's i could definitely see myself using that for the and days. they just added GNU tls support which really? uh, uh, was just recently updated. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also have support for magnet links now via the Aria Ooh. 2 plugin, and uh, they have a new check for updates feature as well as nice. welcome banners and all kinds of stuff. And they've improved support to integrate with the Flash Got Firefox add-on if you use that in Firefox. That's so that's pretty cool. cool too. So you can have those yes. two work together. Liking it. Okay, Matt. My okay. next pick is is something that is not secure. 
It's okay. something I don't really recommend you use outside of LAN ever, and neither does the developer. Ah, okay. Uh, it's 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 called Duco, or uh, what do you think, Duck Two? <laughs> I keep calling it what, Duck Toe or Duck Two or gu- Duck Foo. It's D U K T O R six. I'm gonna say mm. I'm gonna say Duck Two because it's kind of like yeah. I'm sending to something. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Duck Two is a LAN file transfer program, and it's probably its main claim to fame is that it is crazy easy to use. So if you're watching the video version, I have it right here, and yes. It looks like a Metro app. I'm, I'm it not really gonna, does. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going mean, to lie to you. <laughs> but, the, but, you know, I like the Metro fonts. I just don't like the rest of it. But yeah, I, and it, the, the UI works, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's totally usable. It's very Windows phone, but yeah. Uh, but what's super, yeah, it, it is. Uh, what's super simple about it is there's really nothing to set up. Okay, you just, the only thing you can change is your, the color of the mm-hmm. app, the theme of the app, and where wow. you have the file saved. There's literally nothing else you set up. Okay. And then you just run Duck2 on another machine on your LAN. Ah. They have Windows, Mac, and Linux versions, That's so you cool. can you can run uh, all of that, or all of the above. And let me grab my, this is the problem right now with Nautilus. Look at that. There we go. Oh, yeah. So you can run it on all of the above, and you can transfer between. They're also working on mobile apps. It is a GPL uh, application as mm-hmm. well. But, like, if I go, let's say... Maybe so you have it running on I this uh, Unity machine over here, and you can see you have uh, you see Chris F uh, at Action Arch, mm-hmm. and you see Chris F at Solid State iMac. That's the editing machine, and then uh, I don't know why you see two of me on that one, but that happens sometimes. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, uh-huh. but here's my computer. So what I'll do is see here's a I have uh, I have this picture right here. Oh, this is a nice picture, right? It's very nice. Picture. And I know you want that picture super bad. I really bad. want that picture badly. I've yeah. been bugging you about it all week. And this is uh, actually let's do a bigger file. So here's a two okay. megabyte file. Uh, uh, yeah. This one's called Starry Night. This is Ooh. this this man. This would be a great background Party. for you. So let's say you're on my land and I want you to have this. All I have to do is drag this over to your name. Uh, all I said all I have to do is drag this over to your name. Why isn't that working? You drag it over to the name. There we go. There and we now go. it's sending you the file. Oh yeah, there it is. And so now you have the file in your... If you double-click it, it'll just open up like a photo viewer. Oh, so there you go. Oh, wow. uh, in fact, you think you can even single-click it. Uh, now what's nice is not only to transfer the file to you, but you also have the ability to do other things besides just files. So mm-hmm. I can send you some text. So I can say, uh, you know, like... Uh, you know, uh, whatever I wanted to in here, or I can paste it directly from the clipboard, so I could send you a link. Oh, so now I just sent. So now if I send this, you'll get a link in your messenger. Oh, there, there it is. Yeah. So now if you click on it, I think you just single click. Oh, single click. Okay. Yeah. Then you can, can copy, copy it right clipboard. to your clipboard. Now, isn't that nice? Oh. So for sending like sending clipboard contents back and forth, it makes right. it really easy. And once you've sent to somebody, you can keep dragging on that box, and it just keeps sending it to that person. So then you really? get another file there. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And the other thing I can do is I can, from this screen, I can send directly to your clipboard. I can also send an entire folder to you. Now, there's no security here. Right. There's no encryption. Okay. Um, but this might be okay for, like, on a LAN. Maybe. But, like, for my wife and I to send each other some yeah. pictures back and forth. And what's nice is she's on a Mac, mm-hmm. and I'm on, a, I'm on the Linux box, and we're sending back and forth just fine. I'm also I'm able to that. use this to send files back and forth to the editing machine, which is kind of handy. Nice. And I was thinking, like, you, you know, you could even load this on, like, a quote-unquote server machine mm-hmm. that maybe has X. Um, and you could just have like a drop that you just move that files to your server okay. with. You don't have to worry about mounting anything. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And it also supports uh, plugging in an IP address. And so you could probably, you know, if you knew somebody's IP and they had the ports open up, I don't think you'd want to do that. Probably or if you did not. over a VPN. Yeah, I, I see this being really useful for a LAN situation. I think that's where it really hits home for me personally. Yeah. 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 yeah it's a pretty nice program. And the, the interface is, you know, it's Metro y. Very metro, but, uh, but it's not a bad thing. In this particular instance, I'm okay with it because I can read it clearly from across the room. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, if I maximize it, it's very visible. Yeah, uh, and it it has uh, like for some desktops, it has like some tie-ins with uh, the you know the, the icon task mm-hmm. taskbar area and stuff like that. Yeah, but it it definitely just seems to be the one thing is it, it is this the statuses change a lot for people. Oh yeah, and so if you get distracted easily and have it up on your screen, yeah, I notice it's very tiley. <laughs> yeah, you see like the little yeah. Chris F thing just flipped over and now it flipped yep. back. Uh, that actually, like, every time that I see that out of the corner of my eye, I'm like, what, what was that? There's a feature for that. What? 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 Right there. Shiny? See? What? Yeah, yeah, you minimize it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's it's a what, feature. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's actually what I've been doing. <laughs> so it's Problem Duck solved. 2, and it's really for a LAN transfer. Um, it's it's not for WAN transfer, even no. though it has an option in there to send it to an IP address. And it's not secure. The developer even says so. But if, you, you know, if you're not looking for all of that, if you're just looking for something to move files between folks... I think that'd be a good pick, and because so. it's cross-platform, and they're working on a, uh, a mobile version, hmm. zero configuration, it's very high-speed file transfer. Uh, you can do f- entire folders. It has a log of everything gets sent. You can do the text snippets, full mm-hmm. Unicode support, and it is free and open source. It's under the GPL. 
You know, I think honestly, even across, uh, you know, over the internet, I think if it's pictures or it's like a grocery list or a recipe, who cares? You know, I mean, go ahead and send it. I mean, I don't yeah. think that's, that's not such a big deal. Yeah. You're sending your social security number, your banking information, probably not. Yeah. But um, it, I think if you use it wisely and carefully and kind of have set rules in place, I think this would be fantastic over the internet. So, Matt, we got to check in on one last thing All right. before we before we wrap Ish. up the pick segment, dun, dun, just to dun, see dun, where dun, we're dun, at. Dun. So we've had the last three under your shirt yes. going. Today's the last day. Bam. And yeah, the one you got on right yes. now. Very comfortable. Oh, we did it. We broke twelve hundred. We Holy sold. Holy cow! We sold twelve hundred and two <laughs> shirts. Out of a goal of 754, uh, all shirts and hoodies will be coming with a challenge coin. Yay! Holy Batman, that is just unbelievable. I think the t-shirt's been the most uh, really? popular. And see, and for sure. me, it's the sweatshirt. Before one thing, I'm a hoodie guy. And two, it's because this fabric is my go-to sweatshirt now. It's just really comfortable. Yeah. It's not all scratchy. It yeah. feels really nice. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. Uh, I just got done. I was just talking about on the pre-show. I just got done meeting with the electrician. And uh, I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. So that, that, that's, those sales will go to fund some of the renovations. Um, right. At least part of maybe the electrical work. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, sure. basically, yeah. I probably walked in and said, "So your electric, this, yeah, <laughs> that all goes all away. All of this yeah, has we're just to be replaced. Walls, that's yeah. all coming out, so we can just rewire everything." Yeah. And we're doing like uh, we're doing like special kind of stuff to to isolate uh, sound uh, buzz and things like that. Nice. So, yeah, it's gonna be really cool. You know, I've always, I, over the years, I've always had an idea of how I want to build it, and now, hopefully, we're going to be able to build it the way I've been in, envisioning for a long time. I got all kinds of crazy future fundraiser ideas, like, uh, you know, dictate uh, your hairstyle for a day. Okay. Um, you know, just weird. What if, what if that like, dictation like, is, like, shave it? Sh- oh, yeah. No, no, no. It has to remain on the head. Well, I, Unless you want to shave it. I, I, I think that your family members would probably. You could put a bounty on the beard. I'd have you know, we'd have to discuss this with your wife first. Yeah, that's for sure. I, I'm just putting that up. <laughs> as a man, as yeah. married man, yeah. yeah. I give my, but I, I, it's a cool idea, but definitely a conversation to have first. Mm. All right, Matt. Yeah. Well, let's do the news. Mm. the news and this episode is brought to you by ting.com matt <laughs> ting is mobile that makes sense and you can get started by going to last.ting.com ting is our mobile service provider what's up right here bam, boom bam, nexus bam, 5 bam, and bam. the has hizzle and note 2 both on the ting network yes by the way by the way 14 megabit ting service at the new studio Booyah. 14 megabit ting service i'm super Hello. happy about that so here's what i want you to do go over to last.ting.com to let them know that you appreciate them supporting the linux action mm-hmm. show last.ting.com what is ting Ting is a mobile service that makes sense. No BS, no weird contracts, no crazy termination fees that are unfair and extract all the value out of the account. No overages because you only pay for what you use. In fact, this is probably Ting's biggest differentiator is how they charge for the Ting service. It's really, really plain and simple. Ting takes your minutes, they take your messages, and they take your megabytes. They add all of those up at the end of the month. You can have multiple accounts or multiple phones on a single account. Each line is a flat six dollars. They can have shared pools. You can have one phone or, or many or a single phone. Sure. And whatever you use is just what you end up paying. Every plan includes hotspot and tethering. They just recently lowered their data rates too, so now they're even lower than they were before. Nice. I, I got to tell you, Matt. I'm thinking with this Nexus Five and getting 14 megabits, I'm going to be at the studio and the, they haven't installed the internet yet. I'll just there turn is. on hotspot or and and I'll just every device there. I can just Connect to that over the over the Wi-Fi. Uh, it's it's so it's so awesome because you also have a really straightforward dashboard, which means when you have something you need to take care of, you don't have to call into Ting if you don't want to. They give you the power to just take care of it yourself. But if you ever get stuck or you want to have, if you maybe have a family member and you want somebody to call in, they have a no hold customer service. You call them at one eight five five Ting FTW anytime between eight a.m. and eight p.m. Eastern, and a real person answers the phone. Nice. That's I love that. A, it's so nice. And they've also got some great devices. Uh, they're going to roll out uh, support for the iPhone 5 uh, if everything goes as oh. planned on the 11th Ooh. of March. Uh, they'll also have the Samsung Galaxy S5 when that ships. Mm. They're going to have the next HTC One when that's ready. And they're also bringing back some of these value devices. Now, when I Smart. tell you these prices, keep in mind, no contract, no early termination fee, flat $6 a month. Yep. You're only paying for what you use. Kyocera Milano, $75. Samsung Galaxy Victory, one hundred and fifty dollars. You own these phones outright. That's 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 not the contract price. Yep. There is no contract. The rumor reflex seventy five dollars. You can get one of these phones for under a hundred dollars. No contract. Only pay for what you use. The value is ridiculous. Plus, Ting also has uh, Wi Fi hotspots. So if you just want to get yourself a five dollar hotspot or I mean, six dollar hotspot, you put you buy the hotspot once. And if you go to last.ting.com, it's going to take twenty five dollars off that device. You can get the the Novatel Mi Fi fifty five eighty with an LED screen that gives you your signal and your battery life, 130 bucks with our last Ooh. discount. 
130 bucks, and then you own it, and then you just pay for when you use it. Keep it in your drawer if you're not busy that month and when you're traveling. It's also a tri-band LTE device. Oh. So if you're in an area that more and more of them are that have that has tri-band LTE, you're going to get great performance. Mm-hmm. You'll probably exceed by quite a bit my 14 megabits. So you can get the Novatel MiFi 5580, 130 bucks out of the gate. I mean, once la- then you're done. Boom. But you just own that, and then you just pay $6 plus your usage. Six dollar, six dollar hotspot, right there. I mean, now. and what I love about like the, some of the other phones you were pointing out is maybe you want a secondary phone, but maybe you don't want to be necessarily be married to some ridiculous contract. Six bucks a month, you keep it in a drawer, keep it in your pocket, use it, don't mm-hmm. use it, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And then like me, like that's what I, that's what I've been doing. And then as I've started, as my usage increases, it's it's just completely, it's completely transparent right there mm-hmm. in their dashboard. I see exactly where I'm at. It's very clear. I know exactly to the moment what my cost is. Yep. I have a lot of options. It's super easy to track. And then when it comes time to pay, Ting is always really awesome and straightforward. So go to last.ting.com Ish. to get started. And a big thank you to Ting yeah. for sponsoring the Linux Action Show. Thanks mm-hmm. to all you guys who've been switching. I've been hearing yeah. so many stories about people saving money and loving their Ting service. I love that. Yeah. I love that. It's really it's cool awesome. to hear that. All right, Matt, let's okay. start with a security issue that cropped up this week. You might right. have heard about this GNU TLS certificate validation error. Uh, it's kind of funny because yeah. it does it does share some similarities with that highly publicized go-to fail error that Apple had. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, so it's... it's um, yeah, uh, starting uh, so it it affects a lot of distributions, a lot of Linux distributions, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, the, the, there was uh, a handful of go to and cleanup lines that they actually had to change to go to fail lines, which even kind of ah. made it even more ironic. Mm-hmm. And all, they also made other changes to the code. To the code, uh, stay late savings. I can't talk today. <laughs> but the resemblance to Apple's bug is too obvious to ignore. While the two bugs are actually not all that similar technically, other than both being a certificate validation logic, the timing. And look of the new bug does give one pause, uh, linuxweekly.net notes. The problem boils down to an incorrect return value from the function when there are errors in the certificate. Ooh. So it failed a check. It's hard to say how far back this bug goes. Some mm-hmm. speculate as far as 2005, mm-hmm. as the code has been restructured several times over the years. But the GNU TLS advisory warns that essentially all versions are affected. Ooh, boy. This includes things like uh, things that rely on GNU TLS or things like Emacs. Wget Network Manager VLC Git uh, on my box. Let's see. I I did a little check here on my box. Uh, the files that require GNU TLS, the the, the things that are mm-hmm. dependent on it, ARIA2, FFmpeg, oh, FileZilla, wow. Glib Networking, GNOME VFS, GTK VNC, uh, LibVNC Server, Samba, SMB Client. All oh, of man. these use GNU TLS. So it's obviously a it's a it's a it's kind of a big deal. Far-reaching. It's a far-reaching bug because these essentially would all have that certificate validation bug Jeez. if you have an unpatched version. Now you can see here, uh, mine is patched. In uh, right. So here. that's good. So you've been patched, but if you have patches not yet, are going out. Yep. The patches so are going form. out. Check yeah. form, guys. Uh, the code. This is the interesting part. It was found by a code audit done by the GNU TLS founder, uh, Nikos uh, Marvalachalopoulos. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Look at this. Look at that. Marvin. Uh, I mean, that's just... <laughs> that's the biggest that, that is super... Ca- yeah, that's like a... Yeah, boy, that's a big name. Maybe the chat room knows. Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't pronounce that. The interesting part was, is the reason he did the audit is because Red Hat asked him to. They said, hey, can you check into this? And what I want to know is, did Red Hat ask him because of the go-to fail bug that Apple had? And were they like, wait a minute, we got to look into this kind of stuff? Or is the Could timing be. just incredibly coincidental? I don't believe in coincidence. Coincidences, I can't say them either. So clearly, I don't believe in them. I think that it's definitely planned. I think that they wanted to uh, make sure that wasn't. And then you could get all kind of conspiracy theorists here and say, uh-huh. wow, it's interesting that essentially this bug and Apple's bug, both of which are open source implementations of this type of function, both had similar errors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Who knows, right? And you can, that's just, you, right. you can drive yourself. Gotta adjust crazy. my tinfoil. Yeah. No, I, you know, it, who knows? You really don't know. Yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of things, uh, including, by the way, Caligra, uh, mm-hmm. GNU Cache, KDE, Ooh. KMU, Wine, all of these things, if you did a uh, check on uh, Fedora 20, they'll all come back. GNU Cache, all say wow. they depend on GNU TLS. Uh, so, yeah, if you were to uninstall GNU TLS on a Fedora 20 box, you would have to remove 309 dependent <laughs> packages on a standard desktop Ooh. setup. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm Patching's glad they did better. the audit. You got to patch. You got to go patch. Mm-hmm. Get out there and go patch, people. Patch that puppy. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, ours also had a write up. If you're not an LWN uh, subscriber, you can go uh, check out the ours write up. Um, they they also comes with it. a fun graphic. Yeah, that's always good. That guy's yeah. snooping, Matt. Yeah, he's, he's snooping. snooping. He's got a he's got a shot. Got a glass to his ear. Hopefully, there's no liquid in it. That could be awkward. 
Okay, so you know that I have been bouncing back and forth between Chromium and Firefox, mm-hmm. just l- like it's just, a desktop just, environment. Just, just, you think it was a desktop environment the way I switched between them. <laughs> um, yeah, right. I think I might be done with Chrome for good, though. Ooh, yeah. Now, see, you were you were pretty fa- fist shaking at Firefox. I was on... last week. I was. Yeah, I was because so. because of the Flash thing. But I got to tell you, I am so I am so mad at at the Chrome team for the way they are handling this, and I I don't know if. If maybe there's more to the story than what I'm reading on Pharonix, but I'll, okay. I'll read it to you, and you tell me if I'm overreacting. Okay, that okay. sounds fair. Okay. All right, so uh, this is uh, Video Acceleration Takes a Backseat on Chrome for Linux. You guys might have saw this headline on Pharonix. Uh, Amy Fishman explained, this is uh, one of the Chromium developers, that uh, in a comment yesterday that, quote, there is a history of users disabling a blacklist entirely. Now, she is, uh, or he, is talking in reference to Google not planning to to enable uh, the video accelerated um GPU components in Chrome. Okay. And uh, this is something that's been going around for a while, something that, that Firefox has had for about a year, I think. Oh. Uh, he, say, he's, uh, he says, there's a history of users disabling blacklists entirely. So if they just shipped it and had it blacklisted, he's worried that users would disable that blacklist. Uh, he says, this destabilizes the entire browser, and users frequently forget about this action and waste time trying to restabilize their browser later. Hmm. If this landed, I expect that sooner or later we'd get rash... A rash of blog posts explaining how to get hardware decode on Linux for free by disabling the GPU blacklist, and the overall result for our Linux user base would be a worse experience because the blacklist will never be cons- uh, consulted on their system. Uh, he goes on to say that this is a judgment call that I can certainly see how responsible people can disagree, but it's just my personal judgment. So because users will re-enable it if they blacklist it, they're just not going to include it at all. He went on to imply that VA API Linux support, which is the video acceleration API, will never be good enough in good enough shape for Chrome. Uh. And this is the line that just drips of irony coming from a software developer right. at Google. Right. We don't ship code we consider to be prematurely experimental or beta. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <clears throat> a little something in my throat there. Google is the company that labels <laughs> things for beta for like five years. I was Are say, you asking lo- me? How long was Gmail in beta? I was one of the original Gmail people. I mean, like when it first came out. And I'm telling you, yeah, it, it was beta forever. And and as someone who had a large, pr- a large web project that I was contracting on, I can tell you that uh, during that process, there was probably half a dozen Chrome releases mm-hmm. and things would Horrible. fundamentally break between Chrome, Chrome releases that were just standard stuff. Yep. So that line right there, on its face, is crap. So that is a crap justification yes. on its face. Google, you lie! I don't know. I mean, I'm wondering, maybe this person's really misinformed. Maybe that's what I it is. I hope they're really... Yeah, he I says, don't. he goes on to say, yeah, so we don't ship experimental or beta, only code we expect to be stable production quality eventually. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, okay, I can take that. This feature will never graduate to that status... So it's effectively shipping a feature known to be mostly broken on most Linux installation. Now, another Chrome developer, George Lakzini, uh, he also commented on the report saying, supporting GPU features on Linux is a nightmare. He says, I know from dealing with the GPU sandbox. Enabling these features should come after thinking how we can make it available without making Chrome on Linux less stable. Now, is it me or does it sound like they're just whining? I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm just being cynical about it, but it just seems like they're whining about it. It's like, you know, and this may be true, but... You, you know, know, I don't know. Sorry, I'm, Matt, you might have to repeat that. I can't hear you over the sound of Google single-handedly <laughs> enabling the existence of Flash on the internet for another 10 years because they included it with their web browser. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, that whole, that whole Flash And then, thing, you know? uh, remember how they neutered HTML5 mm-hmm. video playback by ripping H.264 support out of the browser they'd already had and licensed? Remember that? Uh, oh, remember yes. how that sell, set HTML5 oh, video back? Yes. And now, now they're conveniently doing something that makes the, the browsing experience on the Linux desktop not quite as good as it is on a Chromebook. But the Chromebook is based on Linux. So how the hell does that work exactly? Well, let me explain this to you. First of all, they're probably on Macs. I'm just going to put that out there. I, I, I'm <laughs> or fairly, Chromebooks. Or Chromebooks. I don't even know about that. I, I, I'd be amazed if they eat their own dog food. I really would. Um, no, I, I believe that these particular developers, I know that there's the you know the folks that do use Ubuntu and Google, I think these particular developers probably aren't huge Linux guys. Um, and if they are, they very potentially could just be cynicalized by a lot of people I think ranting that's and bitching. You know, and I can understand that. I think they um, are Linux people. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of folks at Google who do run Linux. Yeah. Um, and the thing that's crap is... Why not? Yeah. Why not do a check? Yes. That says 
is video card is the video card Intel? Yeah. Is the video card Nvidia? Yeah. Yes. Then enable C GPU acceleration. That's right. No. Then don't. And, and by the way, guys, newsflash: it's yes, there's Gubuntu, but there's also lots of OS 10. Trust me. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. So don't sure. kid yourselves yeah. into thinking they're yeah. Linux only. They're no, Linux. no, no. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, uh, so the reason why this really bothers me is because when you transfer this work off the CPU, uh, first of all. I always feel like if you can get more value out of a GPU, you know, some users, right. they spend hundreds of dollars on their GPU. So why not take advantage of that if I can? That's why I bought that thing in the first place is right. to help with tasks like this. Second of all, usually it makes your machine run a little cooler. It uses a little bit less battery life, not in all cases, but in some cases. Uh, and, and it also makes for a smoother, better web browsing experience. Shares the load. And know. Firefox yeah. has already been able to do this. So that's what confuses me is I doubt they're using some weird voodoo to do this. So if Firefox is already doing this, why not... See what they're doing. I don't know. I mean, and the worst part is, I think, I think why why I'm actually frustrated by all of this is because it's such a public fud spread of this. Is this? I don't know. Maybe the status of this particular VA API on Linux is crap. Maybe so, but it seems like maybe then instead, you know, I don't know. Work with those projects. See what you can do to make that better. But to publicly say all video acceleration on Linux is crap, it will never be good, therefore we're never yeah. going to implement it, God, that makes you sound like a jackass. Well, and I'm going to devil's advocate for a minute and assume, I'm going to assume that they were probably happy-go-lucky fellas, and then they get this barrage of email <laughs> or some horrible thread or you an article. Are yeah, it's like, yeah, Google, and you don't, yeah, you can't do this, and you're being yeah, paid maybe. how much, and that sort of thing. And so finally they were like, okay, fine, we're going to go public. We're pissed off. We probably wrote when they shouldn't have written anything. And boom, you know, they uh, shared their feelings and it didn't go over so well. I, Josh I in the chat room makes a good point. You can't blame everybody at Google for this. No, of course not. I'm talking um, about two the, the individuals that yeah. are included in this article. Yeah, and I think, so. um, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, this is not a topic I have a but lot when of background you, but on. When but when you're dealing with big companies, Microsoft, Google, or whatever, it's hive mind. So one person, two people can actually reflect maybe. poorly on the I mean, company. maybe there's a group, th uh, group yeah. mentality on this. So. I, I feel like it is... Um, it is sort of an old school way of talking about Linux and thinking about Linux, about uh, this this mentality where it's okay to ship an inferior product for that desktop because that desktop doesn't matter to you personally as much. That's uh, that's it really what drives I'm me crazy. Yeah, and and the fact that so much of Google's infrastructure relies on Linux, and and that the Chromebook relies on Linux, and that Android relies on Linux, to see that company who makes all of their money on the backs of Linux, even though they contribute to Linux and help Linux. To some degree, yeah. I hate to see this kind of stuff. And even if it's one person at Google and not all of the company, that person, when they're speaking publicly about a project that's important to Google, has to realize they are acting as a representative to the company. And Agreed. it's so frustrating to see this kind of crap in the news. Yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb. I definitely feel like that this is a one or two individuals that have probably been rubbed the wrong way for the last time. I, I believe they probably are or were Linux people, potentially. And, you know, they're, they're just pissed off. Maybe this will blow over. Maybe they'll come to, you know, who knows? Well, the thing is, they could technically be, and I'm not arguing this, they could technically be 100% right that it's in really crap state. Sure. But the way you handle that is by working with that project. Right. And, and the, reason, the reason why we can confidently say that is because if you look back at the history of this type of stuff, when these companies engage with these communities, mm -hmm. then everybody benefits, including, by the way, Google's own products would benefit from this. Google's own desktops at the own, at their own company would benefit from this. Even if it just improved the tens of thousands of people at Google who use the Ubuntu desktop, yep. it would be worth it in some regards. And you just have to engage with the community. Well, that's you know here's a here's a thought. So the developers that are having this trouble, you know, go down your little Google slide, head on in, you know, drop your kids off at your free daycare, and then while you're there, get yourself one of those gourmet meals that Google's offering you, and then look at your paycheck, smile at how mu how much money you're making, and then from there you can reach out to the community and realize maybe your lives aren't as hard as you're making them out to be. I, yeah. I feel like that. Fixes is, you got to you, know, you got to affect change <laughs> if you want to be part of the solution. Yeah, you gotta, I, I have a hard time feeling bad for them. The, 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 that's yeah. And and Firefox does it. Right. And the thing that's is, my is, point. Reach it, out to Firefox. It makes me want to use Firefox a because. Firefox seems yep. to be it seems to be aware that Linux is worth supporting fully. Right. And number two, I, I'm I, I, down the road. I, I'm going to have a better browsing experience under Firefox right. if the GPU that I paid hundreds of dollars for, and you know theoretically, yeah. is use, is taking off some of the load. Even if it's just scrolling the damn page, if the GPU can do it better, mm -hmm. then they should be using the GPU. That's and with it. Intel GPUs getting awesome and open source drivers there, there's really not a lot of excuses not to enable this. And I think that's the real tie-in is that I could understand it if no other browsers were able to do this successfully under Linux. That would be one thing, but that's not the case. 
and it's being done with a fairly open browser, Firefox. Well, and Why just, not reach out to those guys and just find like out what's this, going on? This, uh, anyways, I could just rant about this for hours, yeah, but uh, yeah. let's talk about something that's kind of interesting, something that's kind of cropped up from the Fedora project. Okay. Kind of curious to know what you think about this. Now, when I think of Red Hat and Fedora, one of the things, not immediately that comes to mind, but one of the things that does come to mind is they they often consult with their legal team mm-hmm, on matters. Mm-hmm. And they you've do. a lot of times heard the answer from the Fedora project, we can't do that for legal reasons. Yes. Um, I think we all probably heard that a few more than once. So this is something that's kind of interesting that's developed partially because of a legal uh, problem they're facing. The Fedora Project is implementing a don't ask, don't tell policy. The Fedora Project is now going to enforce what they're calling the don't ask, don't tell policy for contributors. What the Project Engineering Committee is asking is their members is to conceal the contributor's nationality, country of origin, or area of residence. There's a growing concern about software con- contributions coming from export-restricted countries by the U.S., such as Cuban, oh. or Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, and Syria, and with Red Hat being based out of North Carolina. Didn't we drop problem. that whole uh, embargo thing on Cuba when we realized that they're so not even a thing anymore? No, nope. I mean, that's they're they're doing nope. their own thing. They're trying nope. to just live we, their lives. What, I, mean, well, I like to what I like to call Leave hold a grudge. We hold a grudge. I uh, mean, what do you think about this? Yep. This seems like. Yeah. And by the way, I, the under way the circumstances, you know, the way it's structured is if they find out what somebody's nationality is, then Fedora Legal has to be notified immediately. Well, yeah, because then they have to react accordingly because the U.S. government will be reacting accordingly because they're they're pricks like that. To me, it sounds you know. like um, sounds like putting your head buried in the sand and saying, "Don't tell us, don't tell us, don't tell us." But this, well, I think you got to look at this Fedora's be a legal thing. Well, Fedora's mission is like, look, you know, we for one thing, we really don't want to be political in that sense. You know, obviously political in other areas, but I think in this particular case, they just want the contributors to contribute. That's their whole goal, and they don't yeah. want to get tied in or bogged down spending legal fundage. Dealing with you know various three letter agencies and, and just and hassles like that, so you know courts and whatnot. So I think I, I do get it. I, it's not a solution, but for now it is a workaround that allows people to contribute from countries that have been blacklisted. It for seems reason. like uh, so. you know when you have the ability to check people's source IP and a lot of other yeah. things, it seems like in a legal challenge, the other side could easily make the case. Well, you electively chose not to track this, and it's your responsibility if you're working in this capacity to determine and audit these kinds of things, just like if it was a commercial company. Right. I think and that, whole, and that could happen. Yeah. I think the whole concept of open source projects have to worry about uh, the way, um, you know, these types of uh, political situations affect yeah. their contributors. That's a really interesting thing to even think about in some sense. Puts um, it in perspective. I mean, it really, if you stop and think about it, it really uh, makes you stop and be thankful for the, uh, much the, the groups that make this happen in the first place that yeah. do have to take on policies while they're not ideal, at yeah. least enable the code to keep flowing. Yeah, so, the code does keep flowing, Matt. Yes, I agree. Can't stop signal. Can't stop the signal. Can't stop signal. Uh, so the Caligra Project released a new update this week, and the and the thing, uh, there's a lot of good stuff. But I should just, I, I'll, mm. I should just say, uh, there, there's a lot of good things. The, the word processor, words receive support for comments now in the document. Nice. Uh, Sheets has better support for pivot tables. Woo! Yes. Uh, and Kexi now runs on Windows and has about 30 major issues that were fixed. And Flow now supports SVG-based utensils or stencils, Ooh. which is awesome. Yeah. But the thing everybody's talking about is Corita 2.8.0. New release, big, big, big update in some of the plumbing. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to give you a little demo of it uh, here real quick. But first of okay. all, I'll tell you about some of the new features. So 2.8 marks the, deba- the debut of debut. several new under-the-hood changes. The first major is refactoring of the application's OpenGL canvas code. And so you can, this is something you have to turn on in the settings, but when you mm-hmm. do it, the image, the entire canvas is accelerated via OpenGL. Uh, two, in 2.8, OpenGL support was brought up to OpenGL 3.1 and OpenGL ES 2.0 compliance. Ah. Uh, another, uh, as, um, along the way, uh, Krita is now also being built for Windows, they consider it stable. It also has OpenGL support. And one of the most interesting things for Linux users is an entirely new OpenGL scaling algorithm that offers better quality than the default OpenGL scaling options. The new rendering code uh, by uh, Kazakov, whose time on the project is funded by the Krita Foundation. Mm-hmm. Kazakov also undertook the other major piece of plumbing to debut in 2.8, native support for pressure-sensitive tablets. You know, like the Wacom? Oh, yes. I actually have one. So now in Krita, they have support for that. And like if you press harder... The, the the dry the ink will get darker or you know thicker. Oh yeah, no, that's something you see on other platforms, and so yeah. I, that's something I appreciate. So. And it's something they're doubling down on uh, because Plasma Active is going to work well on tablets. So eventually, I think they're hoping you could just load this program on a tablet. Right. But if you had a Wacom, so uh, you could hook it up. So here is two point eight. I'm demoing it right here. There's a lot of things to show you in a program like this. I just kind of, if you're watching the video version, I just kind of wanted you guys to see the interface. You have 
your, your, your channels, your color channels, your layers over here. Uh, and I'll show you a brush. So watch as I, as I draw this brush. It starts out as a line, but as I make, as I make like turns and curves, you'll see like a little effect that, uh, oh. there's, there's a little feathering effect yeah, right there. You right? see that? Isn't it it kind of smooths out a little bit. Almost like paint, right? It's very paint-like. Yeah, and, uh, and that's based on the brush you picked. This yeah, is more of a rough brush. Of course, there's there's dry brush, there's a right. hundred things this program does. But I I wanted to show you because I have uh, I have I have the OpenGL canvas mode enabled, Ooh. and you can it's kind of you can kind of tell when I zoom in and zoom out. You, if you go into settings and you configure Krita, and uh, if you go to display right here, mm -hmm. you say enable OpenGL, use texture buffer, and then you can tell what scaling mode you want. Ooh. You have to turn that on by default. It won't be using OpenGL to render the canvas. And uh, I did experience one particular potential problem when I did that is uh, when I put my computer to sleep and if I have a Krita document open, mm -hmm. when I wake the computer back up, there's like chunks of the picture missing. It's, oh, it's not able to uh, reinitialize. Kind of, yeah, look at that. Mm. That's cool. Oh, look at that's that. Cool. Now, that. Now, this is where you get a picture in there. Yeah. Go, bleh, 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 bleh. That is really neat. I like that. So, uh, and I also, I've, I've been surprised at how well it handles... Um, Photoshop files. Yeah. Oh, really? So here's a, a PSD file that it opened up, uh, no problem. And you can see oh. I can I can toggle uh, the individual layers here, and I can turn them on and off, which is really cool. Does it support the uh, like a uh, like GIMP's always been famous for uh, RGB only? You know, uh, does this sort? Uh, oh, I didn't YM look into YMCK, that. You know, that was CMYK. Yeah, I didn't look yeah, into. I that. always forget the. Because that's, that's never been a big problem for me under But I know, I know that's like for Photoshop yep. people, that's like their yep. go-to complaint. Uh, maybe the chat room can uh, help us out on that because, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. That is something that people on GIMP talk a lot about. I wonder. I wonder. Anyways, it feels really good. And it, honestly, it's already, I've only been using it for a right. little bit. I already find it more intuitive than GIMP. Real, yeah, I, yeah I really GIMP is, do. GIMP is I, and I've been using GIMP for so long, I get lost in Photoshop. So for me, it's, <laughs> I do, I can't, I, I honestly, I don't know what any of it does. Yeah. So, but yeah. GIMP, yeah, I can do GIMP in my sleep. That's just what I'm used to. But, so uh, congrats to the Krita guys, uh, especially Kavikov for all of his good uh, hard work on the plumbing. Yeah. That looks really great. It looks like an awesome release. And uh, we'll have links to download it in the show notes. It's There's PPAs uh, that they've made. Uh, look, at there's a picture oh, of him wow. testing out the different... Uh, awesome. Yeah, and Whack I think they're working on uh, overall Wacom support and QT itself as well. Mm -hmm. Or pressure-sensitive tablets, I should say. Not and that's important. I mean, for those tablets, that's a big deal because that's really, uh, you know, what the whole point of using the pen's for. Yeah. So, I, you know, cause I've, I, I have... Um, worked with designers who will send me Photoshop files, and so I always have to have Photoshop compatibility. And I do. thought, do I want to use GIMP? Do I only use Photoshop and Wine? Yeah. Now I'm looking at Krita, and I'm thinking, maybe I want to go that Krita way. Krita might be a, a good go-between, because, mm -hmm. yeah, if they're starting off in Photoshop, you're not going to be able to do it in GIMP. Yes, you can technically open the file. Yeah. Lots of stuff's not going to work. Yeah, I've, I, you know, I didn't get a messy. single error. I only opened up a couple of Photoshop files. Yeah. I didn't get a single error, though. Nice. So that was that's was like, a big oh. difference right there. Yeah, just because they're different animals. You know. So it, it, even if nothing else, it might be handy just to keep around. So I have that compatibility mm -hmm. option. That's right. And it's another great release, and uh, you can get it as part of the whole Caligra suite. And uh, and I don't. I think I saw a Fedora repo. I don't know about the other distros. Of course, right. it's in the Arch repo too. And a good, another additional tip: anytime you're dealing with uh, images cross platform, uh, fonts, 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 yes. fonts. Yes. Load yourself up with yes. Apple fonts and Microsoft fonts. That's always that's always the thing. When I open up a document, the yep. first few errors I always get are font errors. Yep, every Just time. Keep that so. font, font directory mm -hmm. uh, filled, and you'll be okay. Yeah, and it's always like a rediscovery process when I reload a box. Mm -hmm. Which fonts right. did I forget? Oh God, no kidding. Annoying. All right, yeah. Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. $200 Chromebook replace a $1,000 Linux laptop? Well, maybe. We'll tell you about it here in just a second. Matt's got it, and uh, he's going to give you his impressions, and I'll give you mine. Look at that. It's actually a pretty good-looking machine. Uh, and we got the Jupiter Broadcasting picture on it, too. Look at that badness. So I'll tell you, I've been running for about a month, and I'll give you my thoughts on it. But first, I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76, creators of machines born to run Linux. I want you to stop fighting with your hardware. Go play with your Linux. they got so many great machines, like the one that I currently covet, the yes. Ultra Pro. Oh, man, I, want, I actually want two of these. That would be for great. the new studio, I want two of these, but we'll see. I don't think that's going to happen. But yeah, no. I, uh, <laughs> I, with the electrician does I'm just, first. I'm picturing it, you know, because these. So the, uh, this has the Iris Pro graphics in it, right? And uh, with the open source driver, right within GNOME, I can plug in the HDMI and I can send a 1080p mirror to our capture machine with no other configuration. Mm -hmm. And this is this machine. That's important. There's so many things I like. It's silent. It's it's light. Uh, it's got good battery life. The screen is incredible. That 14-inch screen with a 1080p resolution, and it's an IPS display. It is super crisp. It's great. You can see it from all the different angles. And, uh, you know, in fact, um, 
JB19 is enjoying his new oh, Ultra Pro. He submitted this to subreddit and he put the Jupiter awesome. Broadcasting sticker on his. Yeah, check God, that that's out. That's a good looking machine. I love it when people send us pictures. Right? I love it. Uh, and this is such a it is such a good looking machine. I love this part right here where they have some of the cooling. It's and you can hold it by this. You can hold it in one hand with by this part at the and bottom. And that's where here. I want my cooling. And I want that ability to hold it in one hand. It's really really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is I think this is the sweetest Linux laptop on the market. And you can get it with dual SSDs. Oh, baby. yeah, yeah it's, and the Iris graphics are surprisingly yeah. competent for oh, gaming yeah. too. Uh, that's that's the machine. Honestly, that's the machine that I'm trying to prevent myself from buying right now by 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 like kind of getting this to see if I can right. fill that gap. And that's what I wanted to try to answer Tane this week is if I could pick up this Chromebook and I got it for 180 bucks off Amazon. Mm -hmm. You've so been kind of slapping your own hands trying to keep yourself off the keyboard. Oh you know? yeah, don't buy that. Oh, uh, yeah. So I got this. I wanted to see if I could use this. So thank you to mm -hmm. System76. I'll be talking to you guys soon. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get this to see if I could, like, have the ultimate lounge in the recliner, watch TV, but still be productive machine. That's right. And one of the things you might notice about this machine is that it is not plugged in. And it has not been plugged in all morning. I have had it out here in the studio since about 9 a.m. It's 1120 right now. And I've had it out here with the screen on. Caffeine is turned on, and uh, it has been unplugged this entire time. And it's just running right away. It's running just fine. Mm -hmm. it, it, the specs on paper do not sound that compelling. It's no, got no. a uh, core, a dual core Intel Celeron 2955U. That's the new Haswell based Celeron. I wish they hadn't called it Celeron. Yeah, it's that weird branding thing, but as you can see here. Yeah, it's very thin, very light. We're currently looking at a little, almost five hours left, 74%. Nice. And it's been sitting there for nice. quite a while. And what's your screen brightness at right now? Boy, uh, screen brightness it's is max. cranked. It's max. You are cranked. Yeah. Up. So you could bring that you could bring that down even and you would get better battery mm -hmm. life. Uh, so here's some uh, here's more specs. Two gigs of RAM. Uh, and I kept the 16 gigabyte SSD that it ships with. One of a lot of the more popular uh, aftermarket changes is to upgrade that. It, mm -hmm. It's a little PCI-based uh, SSD, so you pop off the bottom, and you could, you know, for new off Newegg, you could get, you know, one for uh, like a hundred and something bucks, sure. hundred eighty bucks or something like that. You could pop one hundred and twenty gigabytes in that. But with a sixteen gigabyte SSD using uh, Integros Linux, and I wanted to use Integros uh, because I wanted Arch, but I didn't want to have to hassle with it very right. much. Uh, and uh, even with that installed, the GNOME desktop and a few of my essential applications. I'm still sitting um, pretty good, really. I, I, I'm using about 50% of the drive right now. Oh, so I've, I've, got, I've got about half my drive still to play with. Uh, and uh, it, has a, it has an Intel um, a, a, a GPU. Mm -hmm. right. Supports uh, you know, OpenGL. The screen resolution is 1366 by 768. It's a pretty nice little machine. And while the specs are you know, dual-core 1.4 gigahertz, 2 gigs of RAM, 16 gigabyte drive, it ships with Chrome OS. I ran that for a little while and found it to be pretty limited. Not what yeah, I it's you know because everything's extension based and that's just yeah. kind of meh. It's just if you, know. you anything you want, you add it to yeah. Chrome. And I'll say this: I I think I walked away from Chrome OS thinking I could definitely recommend this to somebody who's not very computer savvy. Sure. And sure. I, I I kind of had a uh, I, this whole process has given me more respect for Chrome OS and Chromebooks in general. Because mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a bit of a doubter at first, but I think this this later generation of of uh, Chromebooks. Well, it's like Haswell and stuff yeah. built into it. So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. So there are a few things you have to consider when you're looking at doing something like this. And what I really wanted to ascertain is if I put a full-fledged operating system on this, could I actually use it as a laptop? Right. Because once you take Chrome OS away, you kind of take away its, its, its largest limitation. Uh, so I, and I agreed a lot uh, recently. I had this, I've had this for about a month and about a week ago, there was um, a blog post where uh, a, a gentleman was looking at the same situation. He's like, could I buy this Chromebook that is mm -hmm. essentially subsidized from Google, replace the OS, yeah. and still get value? And right. I think I think the answer to that is yes, but with some caveats. Okay. So you're going to have to go through whatever installation process for whatever distro. But let's for this for the sake of this review, I'll talk about Arch. You have to go in, and Arch has a good has a good wiki page specifically for the C720. This is the Chromebook Acer C720. Okay. They got a good they got a good how to. The, the main thing you need to know about is you have to enable developer mode for the BIOS. Oh, when right. you go in there, you go in, you go in, the, you go into Chrome OS, you turn on the, you turn on developer mode, and then, then you essentially get a C BIOS. BIOS. It's 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 like a it's a version of Core Boot that is that emulates a traditional BIOS. And at that point, you know, I just just for testing purposes, I could have used like a memory stick. Mm -hmm. I hooked up an external USB CD ROM. Oh, okay. I just booted from the Integros. ISO CD 
and just installed Linux like you would on any regular computer. Nice. Once legacy BIOS mode is enabled. Are you able to also do a flash drive? I mean, that's yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, because yeah. that's my preferred method. Yeah, yeah. I just DD. I was just curious, drive. like how old school right. could I could I actually uh, okay. install from a from a from a ISO nice. burnt to a CD, and you can, and it, it worked just fine. And with Integros, uh, there's no setup. You just wow. you boot, you install, just like I'm sure. It, would it looks be like for uh, wireless, you got uh, Ethereum. I think so. Yeah. yeah, that's what I saw when I ran the uh, hardware yeah. check. Yeah, uh, I have all of the hardware specs, by the way, uh, in the show notes. Awesome. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. It's a it's a it's a Qualcomm uh, Theros uh, AR nine four six two wireless F nine K, which I use on my netbook, and it's been crazy reliable. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's never had a problem with it. it. Doesn't have an Ethernet port. No. So the only thing you're using with this thing is Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So think of the functionality you would get with a Chromebook with a little bit extra. Right. Uh, right. So I, I want to talk about the cons first, and okay. then I want to get into the pros, because okay. I just want to get the cons out of the way. Uh, the first con is the screen viewing angle is really, really terrible. Uh, it, is, it is terrible enough that when I have something on the oh, screen yeah. that I want to show my wife, like she almost could never see it. Like Very I have to directional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a cheap display. It's not an IPS. Mm -hmm. It's not a great display for that. Uh, and when I'm working on it for a long period of time, I find myself adjusting the monitor a lot, trying to get that right, that right angle. Because like right now, if I'm looking at yours, I fine. can see it fine. Yeah, it's, it's like I'm sitting yeah. right in front of it. Yeah, it's it, it, that's that's the characteristics yeah. of a higher end display or an IPS mm -hmm. display. You, this is some older school technology. Here. Sure. Uh, that being said, again, 180, 200 bucks. Not not such a nah. big deal. But if it bugs you, that's something to consider. I, even when sitting directly in front of it. I sometimes had issue with it. Also, uh, no USB three, as far as I can yeah. tell. Yeah, but again, price point, you know. So I guess that probably plays a part into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Buzz so kill though. I'll talk about the pros though. Okay. Battery life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've done minimal tweaking. So uh, you know, uh, one of our favorite tools here on the Linux Action Show is PowerTop. Yes. And yeah, me some PowerTop. I going through this process, I. On both machines, I made some. It's a tweaks. real eye opener. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and what's great about PowerTop on the Chromium or on the Chromebook here is I actually get like, see, on on the Bonobes, I and I maybe I don't have the right thing installed. I don't get my current wattage draw, but on the Chromebook, I can actually see how many watts each individual component yes. is pulling. And one of the things I found out on both of these computers is that my sound card, my sound driver was taking the most power. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and uh, it turns out, and I have more documentation linked in the show notes, most sound cards disable, most sound card drivers disable power saving for the sound card driver. And so it's constantly hitting the CPU. Even I, when it's not being used. Yeah, and yeah. I did not really think about this. And on a desktop and on the Bonobo, I don't care a lot about power, so I didn't right. really look into it. But on the Chromebook, I was like, okay, I really want to try to whittle this down. And so the other thing I did, so I solved that, the other thing I enabled was CPU frequency scaling, so that way I can draw those CPUs. Right. They, they range from 800 megahertz to 1.4 gigahertz, so they, and I, I'm, I'm being fairly aggressive sure. with the CPU power saving. So uh, that's something I did. Mm -hmm. And if I run the screen at about 70% brightness, mm -hmm. I'm getting about six and a half hours of battery life. Which is, if you think about it, that's, pretty good. That that's very, you know, it's about netbook friendly, you know. Really. And it's you're you're getting closer to like even MacBook Air territory. Mm -hmm. You really are. Uh, and I'm not being particularly gentle. Uh, one of the things I I tried out when I was doing this test is this awesome Gigapan image from New York. And I mean, oh, wow. it's a it's a full OpenGL image that I'm scrolling around and I'm browsing oh, so that's through a lot driving. of usage. Yeah. I'm installing software during mm -hmm. this process. You know, I'm trying out different things. I'm reading how tos to save battery through this whole period. And I still managed to eke out about six and a half hours. And I'm wondering, like, if I went crazy with some of the other power savings things, could I maybe even get to seven, seven and a half I'd hours? I'd say you potentially could get to seven and a half, eight. If, you really, if, if it was idle, I'd say seven and a half, eight, realistically. Yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, if I didn't, yeah, just as a straight up test. Exactly. The battery life is at the point now, when you get to that, about that six hour point, what I have noticed is I turn that machine on towards mm -hmm. the start of the day, yeah. and then I just leave it. Yeah, you don't care, Like, right? if I get yeah. up and walk away, I don't even put the screen to sleep or anything. I have caffeine turned on yeah. all the time, and I just... It's always on, running from battery. I can always pick it up. And the other thing that's really nice is the power adapter is tiny. So I have it uh, in, like next to my couch, and I'm sitting there watching TV. I just reach over, and I can plug in. And I, it also fits in the armrest. That's and, nice. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a little bit cheaper than a tablet. And you get right. essentially all the tablet-like functionality plus a keyboard. Oh, see, that's, so, that's oh, yeah. No, that's there. The one thing, cool. here, hand me that for a second. Yeah, one right. thing I want to kind of show you that's a little wonky, and it, it, it has bitten me, and all of these Chromebooks suffer from this, yes. is... The keyboard layout is such that I don't know if you can if you can see it, but where there's normally a caps lock key, 
there's a search button. Oh yeah, that would be that would bite me hard. And that's not so you yeah. and that is essentially your super key. So like right. when I press that, it activates the uh, the gnome, uh, you know, uh, search and dashboard thing. That would annoy me. And the other thing, can you gets, remap yeah, it though? Couldn't you just remap the keys? Oh, probably. Yeah. yeah. So if you're willing to remap it, no yeah. big deal. But if you're not, it's annoying. But yeah. check out what's above the backspace. Okay. So say maybe your backspace in rapidly. Oh God, now that's I don't care what you do. That's gonna that's gonna <laughs> that's bite you in the ass. The power button. Oh, that's gonna bite. Yeah. And that's, so and it's just one press. So no. I'll just give you a demonstration. Like, so oh, say I'm typing along. Da, da, yeah. Da, da, say you're da, getting da, happy da. with the backspace and you tap that button. Uh, it will. Uh, I think maybe or maybe not maybe I actually disabled it because there is I do yeah, have links may in disabled there. it but I'll, normally it would just be like boop, power yeah it shuts off, right done. it starts shutting down you're I guess done. I so all I have, your work gone I have a guide linked in the uh, show notes where you can remap that yeah too. yeah I think that's my, I did yeah re, yeah remapping will save your bacon but if you're kind of an out of the box kind of person um yeah you're gonna have a bad time with the power button yeah yeah and it depends some and it depends like. Uh, it, it, some like desktop environments will intercept it as a key press. Some won't. Um, well, I don't understand what they were thinking with that because uh, I'm brutally honest, that's a yeah. stupid place to. Well, put on it. Chrome mean, OS, it brings up a dialog. I think, yeah, if I recall, okay. I really, yeah, that, I could see that. I literally so. used Chrome OS for like two hours. Yeah, like, as much I'm as you could done. tolerate. Uh, what do you done. think of the touchpad? What was your uh, feeling? So, touchpad, great question. Touchpad. Um, two things. Okay. You got to do a little extra work to get it to work. Uh, it's a little tricky. Okay. And uh, the second thing is, is I've noticed that after suspend, it sometimes quits working. Ah, okay. So I went with external mouse, just mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. I also found it to be pretty cheap. It's just not a great touchpad. No, it definitely felt. It definitely feels like there's some uh, delay. This is not the. Um, this is not. There's a. There is a C720P, which includes mm -hmm. touch and an improved trackpad. Oh. And so I haven't tried. I didn't need touch, so I didn't want to spend more money. What's the price differential on that? Like fifty bucks? Or something? I don't know. I think it's like eighty bucks, but it's not yeah. huge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to tell you guys about a couple of things you can do. To uh, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, IBAM, I B A M, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the intelligent battery monitor, and it's a pretty cool app that'll give you your 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 run rate estimation for your mm -hmm. battery usage, which yes. your BIOS estimates your battery usage is, and then it can also plot it using GNU Plot. Oh, check that I out. I didn't find it to be totally accurate, but oh, it might okay. work better on some systems. Okay, okay, so it may work better on your computer. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, IBAM is worth checking out. Uh, cool, man. Also, uh, if you do a little, if you do a little uh, jumping around, you can find the GNOME power settings. You can actually restore the old graphing that GNOME right. does there. Yeah. Something else I turned on on the Chromebook, and I don't know if it's a mixed bag, it, it's it's thermal daemon. Thermal daemon yeah. it will it will it'll monitor all of the Intel sensors and it will dynamically scale your processor to keep the thermals low. Oh, that I like. Yeah, that it, I love. It seems kind of like okay, this could be sort of an interesting way because yeah. you know obviously the hotter the CPU, the harder it's working, the more power it's drawing because yeah. that heat is excess power, right? So if you reduce the temperatures, you're reducing the power usage. Mm -hmm. However, and I don't know if this is a big problem or not, but in PowerTop yeah. I noticed. That the thermal demon is constantly checking the temperatures, so, so it's, could, it's doing a lot of wake ups. Right? Yeah, it could actually <laughs> end up biting you in the butt yeah. with uh, power consumption. Yeah, right. but it's an interesting idea, yeah. and it's available in a lot of repos. And you have to have the Intel architecture, one of the more recent right. ones. But if you want to run it on your laptop, it'll keep the fans down. And I think that's the main thing, guys. You're not really so concerned about the battery life, but you're more concerned about ther you know, like uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, cooling, basically, um, like cooking your crotch essentially while it's sitting on your yeah, lap. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is a good way to avoid that. Yeah, so. exactly. Uh, the other one that I liked, the other the other program I liked quite a bit. Let's see if I I don't know if I have it on the uh, Bonobo here that I have hooked up to the capture history. But uh, if yeah, here you go. Okay. So if I have this command in the uh, show notes, this is just a really quick way to uh, mm. grab the file, every, uh, grab a file every two seconds, and oh, you can nice. see here. These are my different processor frequencies right now. So these are each each line represents a CPU core, right. and uh, I'm I'm catting and grepping a proc CPU info, and I'm watching that file. And every time it changes, every two seconds, my screen updates. So one of the things I did during my testing is I was able to use this to determine what is running in the background. Yeah, there you go. You see, so you can see it right there now. Right now, it's running at one one point four gigahertz. But yeah. So in the terminal there, you're able, I'm able to kind of, as I experiment with stuff, get a sense for what's pushing that GPU, or that CPU, sorry, what's pushing that CPU, and then kind of dial things back from there. Not if you can see that, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard to see. And hard to see. We don't have the Chromebook hooked up to the capture yeah. because that, that it doesn't do 1080. Doesn't do, yeah. yeah, it doesn't do 1080. Well, actually, it does do 1080 out, but for the, what we need here in the show, we need mirroring, and the mm. screen doesn't do 1080. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I also have linked in the show notes... Um, a, a a guide on making your CPU driver use less power on Arch. You just go into etsy modprobe.d slash audio underscore powersave.conf 
And here, I, I would just... You I'll know what I love about that guide is that I don't even care. I don't even read what most... I mean, you don't have to... I mean, you should read it, but obviously... Yeah. I mean, you should know what you're doing, but you, it's trustworthy enough and, and it works well enough that basically if you're really lazy, you can just copy and paste that stuff in. Create yep. a file, bam, boom, done. So there, you know, uh, there we, actually, Easy. you know what? I'll open this up in Vim. Yeah. So if I open up this file and this, so this tweak right here, I haven't noticed, we'll see, like if I go to do a Skype call in the next week and I have a problem, maybe I'll have to turn this off. But in my mod probe uh, file, mm -hmm. uh, uh, under mod probe, so it's slash Etsy slash mod probe dot D slash audio underscore power save dot com. I added the line options, sound, HDA, Intel, power save equals one. Right. And by doing that from power top, my sound card went from the top thing in power top taking the most power to not even really showing up in the top 10. Made a huge difference on both devices. You know, in worst case scenario, you could script it to where you basically on off, you know, zero one zero. I suppose one, zero, so, one. yeah. You could, I mean, that yeah. way it's like, pfft, you know, no, who cares? Gotta make a Skype call, boop, boop. Done. Yeah, I, I suppose you could do that. I, I have. Messy, but whatever. I have, honestly, I don't, I mean, I. Or have it execute when you run Skype and then when you close Skype, have it like, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, post, yeah like a postscript and a prescript. Sure. I, I have honestly not. Had a single issue. I've been running for a couple of days. I, I've never, I, I've never had problems. With I'm it sure myself. there must be a reason why developers for the drivers have turned off power saving, but I don't know. I uh, yeah, it, maybe it's just a, a less moving parts to have problems with. It's hard to say. Yeah, that's that's probably it. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about. I want to back up a little bit and talk about uh, C BIOS because one of the things this challenging um, Linux boxes, new Linux boxes these days is. Uh, UEFI, mm -hmm. and in, in a lot of cases with UEFI, it also usually includes some, includes some sort of crappy bio simulation. Right. Uh, this is, you know, these problems, these problems when you when you buy a machine that is not built for Linux, there is a lot of little things that bug you. And Core Boot is one of these things that could really solve a lot of these problems. CBIOS is an open source legacy bio, BIOS implementation, which can be used as a core boot payload. It implements a standard BIOS calling interfaces that typical x86 proprietary BIOSes implement. Hmm. And that's what you get when you disable developer mode on a Chromebook, is you get CBIOS. Oh. So it, it is an interesting way to sort of get an open source uh, BIOS. And I get, I'm told that if I had left Chrome OS on there, mm -hmm. I could go into Chrome OS and permanently set it to developer mode. Oh, really? As it stands right now, actually, why don't you shut that thing down? Yeah. Okay. Power that guy off. And uh, where's your uh, power? Sorry, up here? Yeah, over there in the corner. Ooh. Okay. And I want you to see what you have to do because it's a little bit of a yeah. There you go. It's a little bit of a rigmarole. And the problem is, it leaves it so you the 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 end result is is that you can't leave it unattended. When you power it up, the Chromebook will come up with. Uh, there you go. So here, put it up on the camera if you would, and then press that power button. So when you oh, sorry, so Matt just turned it on and it boots up and it comes to this screen right here this this white screen and what it's going to say here in a second is press control L to continue and it's just going to hang there until you do that because okay. you have to go into developer mode. Now, it might let me see is it yeah, there now? Go ahead and, uh, oh yeah, okay. So about, yeah, there it is. So you see right here OS verification is off. Oh, you can press spacebar space to re enable, re but you don't want to do that. Nope, don't want to do that. You want to do control L, which it doesn't say anywhere on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't say that you gotta you gotta just know that you press right. Control L, then it loads the legacy BIOS, and then once the legacy BIOS starts, it'll then kick into Grub. Nice, yeah. And you see C BIOS as it boots up there, and, then and I'll show you guys the boot time's pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a 16 gigabyte SSD with a dual core processor, so you know it's about what you'd expect. And you could put a faster SSD in there if you want. The bottom pops off. Uh, and uh, there you go. Now you're at the GNOME desktop. Now, some folks in the uh, chat room are saying don't press space that you potentially could br actually yeah. brick, the, yeah. uh, brick the unit. Well, because I don't have Chrome OS on here anymore. So that could, oh, that could yeah, be so a that's paradox a, there. Yeah. It's a problem. Yeah. So, and I don't know, maybe I, maybe I want to reload Chrome OS. I just right. I, I just thought, I just want this to be a Linux box. And because it's 16 gigabytes of an SSD, hmm. I didn't really feel like I had the room for Chrome OS. Right. Yeah. And maybe if I wanted to get a bigger SSD drive. Well, and if you bricked it, it's a great excuse to get a new drive. True. <laughs> the way I look at this thing is I wanted to spend the minimum amount of money possible and right. get the most. And I know it's it's like it's a tough economy. People's budgets are tight. Yeah. And I wanted to know, could this serve as the role of a thousand dollar or maybe like a low end ultra book? Right. Right. I would say for me personally, probably not because I'm really conscious about performance. Any yeah. kind of leg really bugs me. Um, but when I come down and I sit down, I'm like, okay, I'm in relaxed mode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of expectations. I'm really only planning to browse the web, maybe read sure. email. 
Well, this it does those things. Seems like this would be a really slick alternative to uh, say the net, early netbooks. You know, the, yes. tri- uh, the triple oh, E's. Yeah. I mean, God, this. If you were a netbook fan, this is a slam. Yeah. And I'm a netbook user, yeah. and this has got a much I, better. I screen. also think you know it's it's superior to a tablet in a few ways. Yeah, uh, it's got HDMI out. It's got uh, USB, several ports. The audio is good. Somebody asked me in the subreddit if I had any issues with the mm-hmm. audio out jack. I don't. Sounds oh. good. Um, and the battery life is good. It's maybe not as Excellent. as great as like a Nexus, but it's right in that range. It's about, it's on par with the yeah. on par with Triple E's, I think. Yeah, Pretty oh close. yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, and the performance is way better than anything you ever mm. saw in the original netbooks. Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. I, oh, yeah, I don't think it can quite replace a thousand dollar laptop, no. but I think it could easily replace sub thousand dollar laptops. I if you agree. don't, if you especially if you replace that. Uh, if you replace that SSD in here, I have a link to a how to gr- upgrade the SSD in the C720. You can see that bottom pops off. Look how much of that thing is battery. It's right here, huh? Yeah. Look okay. at that. The thing's massively battery. Holy cow. Yeah. And then oh, the it's SSD. Just, it's just really thin and long. Okay. The SSDs yeah. are these um, these uh, little these little guys right here. This the same type of SSD the NUC takes. Interesting. NUC. The, uh, you the just Intel. pop those bad boys out and uh, they yeah. pop in and out a little bit like RAM. And I, yep. And I, you okay. know, I never even really heard the fan kick up. That's a good thing. Oh, 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 oh! And oh, I want to mention. But oh. I want to mention. I got a USB three. Um, I don't. And I don't know if this has USB three or not. I couldn't mm-hmm. tell. And maybe the specs things tells. Uh, but I got a, a USB Ethernet adapter, plugged it in, and was able to successfully do wow. Steam in-house streaming oh. of Batman Arkham Asylum on the Chromebook. Yeah. So what? Steam streaming works. Is, wow. Does okay. not work that well over right. the wireless. Not at least at no, my house. Right. Maybe at your house it might work better. But right, at my right. house, it was really laggy. It started up, it would run, but it was a nightmare. But as soon as I got that Ethernet adapter, pfft, I'm telling you what, I was able to I was able to stream Steam That's games with this thing. And yeah. so basically, you have an adapter that what USBs in and yeah. Do I bring it out? Yeah. Oh, I didn't bring it out. Oh okay. yeah, I did. Oh okay, cool. Yeah, I did. I did bring it. I was. Just, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. A little so, bit like the old uh, uh, modems. Yeah. So it's just a little StarTac mm-hmm. uh, uh, USB three, and I don't. And I it looks like a new egg purchase or something. Uh huh. And yeah. it's it's just a gigabit adapter, and nice. I plug this. I plug this into the Steam or to the Chromebook, and then Steam worked. Just no wow. problem. Well, see, that's and that's kind of cool. So you got the proper horsepower machine running the game, and then you're just streaming that sucker right up to the little uh, mm-hmm. little laptop. That's cool. And I I got a three O. I don't know if that does three O. Mm-hmm. I couldn't tell by all I know is it was fast enough for Steam streaming. Uh, and the reason why I didn't know, I, the reason why I haven't tested if it's th- uh, right. USB three O, it might be. It's just I don't have any. Aside from this, I don't have any USB three. So device. Integris, you plug that thing in and it just sees it as Ethernet, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah plug it in right now. You yeah, can, yeah, yeah. Just for you giggles. Can, yeah, it just shows right up. Because oh. um, it's just a standard like a real tech adapter or something. Yeah. It's it's just a standard chipset in there. It's nothing, nothing too unusual. Of course, we don't have anything plugged into yeah, it. But it should uh, at least uh, show something. Yeah. See it there. Oh, well, actually, to, I think you have to go into networking. Yeah, and in GNOME, and in yeah. GNOME three ten, they don't show the that's Ethernet right. under the menu, well, but cool. they will in three twelve. They will in three twelve. So very very cool. I think I don't know if this is gonna I don't know if this is gonna replace a full on like something like the Ultra Pro or something like right. that. Because no. Yeah, I, I having played with the yeah, there's 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 a lot of love there. <laughs> the <laughs> the, the problem I have is yeah. that thirteen sixty six by seven sixty eight resolution. Right. At the end of the day, yeah. I think I, I'm maybe I'm just like a first world bigot, but at the end of the day, <laughs> I think nineteen twenty by ten eighty is my new minimum. That's, that's what, well, that's kind of how you're wired. Because what's your res on this? I mean, it's like it's thirteen sixty six by seven sixty eight. Uh, yeah, it's just okay. too small. Right, it's too small. Right. It's not enough space. I could hook it up to a to a second monitor with that HDMI out. That might make it a hey, little. At better. least unlike a netbook, when you load, I don't know your preferences. It's not all half cut off and stuff. <laughs> God. Yeah, things look a lot install, better these oh, days. Geez, no and kidding. and GNOME has ran great. Yeah, I, I actually yeah. didn't have enough free space to install KDE, but GNOME okay. three ten has been perfect. Um, and I, cool. I, I think, you know, if you, if you want a web browsing machine mm-hmm. and you, you kind of like been stuck between this and a tablet, I go, I'd go More this network. way. <laughs> Unless you want some tablet, tablet specific app. Uh, this is, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And see, I, the tablets are, I literally will use it like we have an old iPad one. I watch Netflix on it. That's about it. I don't, you know, yeah. I don't know what else to do with it. Yeah. So. I think so. I, you know, I originally sat out to see if it could replace a thousand dollar laptop. Right. I'd say for some work case scenarios, yes. Okay. But the thing it really replaces is that tablet. It really yeah. that's really what yeah. this thing competes with. I would agree. And Chrome OS. Yeah, right. no, yeah, that that's gotta go. But yeah, I think it does really well. I love the fact it works real well with the Wi-Fi. You know, the USB stuff's yeah. working great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, so machine. check the show notes. I've got the install guide for Arch. I've cool. got uh, links to battery saving techniques, including mm. getting that sound card down. If you're on a Linux laptop right now and 
You haven't tried out Power Top, son. You got to get Power Top loaded. You got to check that out because it'll tell you that sound card's eating up um, right. all kinds of all kinds of uh, uh, power. It's kind of ridiculous. It's very zippy. And I've got the hardware specs uh, listed in the show notes. Yes, it does feel very zippy. Mm-hmm. I've never like it, like launch Firefox. Yeah, it's, right. Yeah, this is a real test. I got something else open too. So Firefox kind of... is it's not like it's an immediate, but it's well, but it's geez. pretty responsive. Yeah, no, that's that's reasonable. Yeah, that's there reasonable. Yeah. And and when you have like Firefox Sync, it's actually really handy because I can work on something over here on this computer and decide, ah, guess what? I feel like moving into the living room. Yep. Firefox Sync, I, I just fire up Firefox, go to other tabs, right. open up my resume my browsing session on the Chromebook. Well, it's yeah, pretty nice. It seems to, you know, seems to be pretty responsive, pretty yeah. happy little guy. Yeah. It's it's definitely like Luxit. I bet you could put an average user on that, or even you know, uh, you know, a, a, a user just doesn't have a lot of demands performance wise, and they'd be really fun. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, I think for me. Oh, here's I another test. Let's do a doc here. Oh yeah, those G- 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 it's okay. zippy. Yeah, G- yeah that's super crazy. Zippy. Yeah, lots of nice stuff on there. Yeah. The only yeah. problem is that screen. I think if you could wait right. one generation, maybe they'll improve that screen. Is that's a bit all, and the keyboard's a little cramped, and with the weird placement, it's a little awkward. So there's some compromises. Right. I guess oh yeah, I'm totally. Saying. No, I think I definitely think there is. But here's a little. Yeah, if, if you're willing to make those compromises, you'll be happy with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it pretty, seems like it's pretty. Yeah. I, it definitely faster than a netbook by yeah, far. Yeah. Oh yeah. By well, far. Even it's with all two about gigs of RAM. that that Haswell based uh, yeah. uh, Centrino or Celeron, sorry, and the SSD. Yeah, really definitely it. faster. This is very nice. I, I, I have to get one. And I've never heard it kick up. It's never gotten you know the fans. I've never heard oh, them right. get super loud. It's never gotten. You know, like I've never had a problem with that. Nice. Uh, so check out, yeah, like, like I was saying, check out the show notes. We got some stuff in there, including um, some article. I, mm-hmm. I found a good blog post from somebody who was also taking this challenge on, right? And uh, their experience. And it's probably there. all what all open source drivers. I can't think of anything yep. proprietary. Yeah, I there. don't think there is a single thing in there that uh-huh. I have right now that's proprietary because I definitely didn't have to load any drivers. Mm-hmm. Nope. Um, and when I, and nope, uh, nope, nope. it's an Intel audio card. It's a Ethereos network uh, for the Wi-Fi. Yeah. And uh, it's an Intel uh, GPU and an Intel CPU. Very, very nice. Stays yeah. nice and cool. Yep. No uh, cooking crotches. You'd be okay. So there you go, Matt. That's yes. the Linux Action Show's look at Linux on a Chromebook. Mm-hmm. And well, that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast map of a Hey, Matt. Yeah. Before we get out of here, why don't we cover some emails? So Drool writes in. Nah. Lord Drool, as a matter of fact, I watched your review of the Chromebook next week. What? Wow, that's... By that's... removing Chrome OS, you remove the command line tools, which enable you to set up a legacy OS as a default for boot, huh. and also to cut to the boot wait time down to one second. Yeah, there is a little bit of a delay. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, these require writing to the normally write-protected core BIOS first, hmm. admittedly a hairy procedure. Most purchasers of this machine will have the 2 gigabyte model, as the 4 gigabyte model is exclusive to the U.S., so I have the 2 okay. gigabyte model, too. Okay. okay. It goes on to say most Linux distros boot via ISO Linux, which produces an insufficient memory error to install error on the Chromebook, hmm. which apparently is a bug. You also did not mention that the C720P has a more responsive trackpad than the C720. I did enjoy your comments, however, about the Arch installation on the machine from the future. Lord Drool. <laughs> That's cool. I love that. You told Time me. paradox accomplished. He actually, I he did actually, mention those things yeah, because he said yeah. I didn't mention those yep, things. Yep. Flippity floppity flu. Time Woo. paradox. Um, Star Trek. I don't know. Yeah. So thank you. And by the way, also an immediate follow up, Krita CMYK Sports since two thousand five. Yeah. How about that? Loving it. That's crazy. Loving it. So yeah, you know the chat room was asking a few questions. Um, specifically, again, I just want to mention this is a StarTac, and I got it from a uh, Newegg. Yeah. It's their USB three model. That mm-hmm. was one of the questions. Well, was there another question? That, can't I remember. can't think of anything. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you probably. And the great thing about Newegg's, anytime something's compatible with Linux, almost always in the comments. That's what I did. I checked yep. the comments. Yep. That's why I always do. Uh, yeah. And you know, so just a just a sort of a capper on that last segment is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep I'm gonna hang on to this. I'm gonna keep Arch yeah. on there for a while. See yeah. how it does. And uh, you know. Just uh, I'll, I'll be able to update you guys on a future Linux Unplugged or something. Yeesh. All right, so uh, our next email comes from Philip. Okay. He writes in about the Red Hat certificates. He says, hey, oh, guys, in a recent Coda radio, you mentioned the Red Hat certificates. Right. So I checked it out, but I'm not quite sure if it's worth the effort. Could you talk a little bit about the significance and the best way to prepare yourself for the test? I think of a lot, I think a lot of last viewers could really benefit from that. Mm. Cheers, Phillips. He says, by the way, thanks for the GoDaddy code. He says, and don't worry, that video with Danica where she was all muscly, that was fake. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, didn't know. Good to know. What do you think of uh, like uh, certificates mm. like you know your Red Hat Enterprise certs or your Novell certs for uh, SUSE Linux? What do you think of these? Kinds Honestly, of things? I've you know, and I and I used to do a lot of uh, PC repair stuff like that, both small businesses and clients, and I never bothered with any of them. I just never did. I literally just never saw the need to. 
Um, uh, you know, A plus is essentially considered to be the GED of certif- uh, cert- certs usually. I'm not trying yeah. to insult anybody, but that is factually true. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. A plus you know, is not. Yeah, no one cares. This uh, is. I don't know if it's no. fair, but I too. I have a. It'll scale. get your job at, at like Best Buy, maybe. A but, plus you know. and networking plus and things like that. Yeah. I'm not a, a huge on. Some of the big certs, like the Red Hat certifications, those whether they can be practically implemented. I think too. That's true. Yeah. I think they've always had a bit of a prestige around them because they that Red Hat certification process yeah. teaches you the fundamentals of Linux administration. Right. And it's really hard to get. You have to go through like a, the test involves a lab where right. you right. you are actually timed and monitored while you resolve a situation in a lab scenario. Mm-hmm. It's not all just paper based. Right. Which well, I, th- I think adds some cred- credibility to it. But also I think certs and someone brought this up in the chat room. I think certs also are important if you're trying to get that interview. I mean, it just, you know, not even about knowledge. It's literally like, you know, the, do you have the degree? Do you have the certs? I mean, I think that they're pro- that probably plays into it as well. Working yeah. for yourself, you don't care. Uh, we talked but, more in Coda Radio, but what, what I said in Coda Radio was a lot of times when, you know, I've, I have been in the position over the years where I have been interviewing um, guys that we bring on to our consulting team, or I've been brought in to interview somebody for a company that wanted to hire somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I look at that resume and I see, I see certs on there and I completely skip over it. Right. The Red Hat certs, some of the Cisco certs, a few of the security certs, those are the only times I stop and go, oh, well, look at this. It's useful impl- yeah, yeah. useful knowledge, sure. Uh, another uh, um, uh, rapid uh, follow-up from uh, action producer and you get developer Rotten Corpse in the chat room. Here's why I was confused. One port on one side of that Chromebook is USB 3.0. Oh, I'll bet yeah. you it is. Could be the one I have the mouse plugged Could into. Be. No, you're blue here. Or no, oh, that's, is it? That's, that's HDMI. No, that's, that's HDMI, HDMI yeah. so yeah, it's, I'd have to. I bet I have the mouse plugged into the USB 3 port. I bet you anything. Yeah, black. Blue. Okay. Okay. It is yeah. blue. So blue yeah. is USB. Okay. Yeah. Yep. There you go. So there is a. So that's the port to plug this Ethernet adapter into. And Bob's your uncle. Thank you, Rotten Corpse. So Philip. Anyways, to answer your question, um, and also actually to sort of the zoom out from your question. Yeah. There's a there's a story that I just haven't really found the context to fit it into last yet and really look at it. But I'm seeing a lot of reports that one of the gro- biggest growing areas of the IT sector for jobs is Linux jobs. It's, yeah, I've been seeing a lot of reports about that. People looking for Linux work. I have a buddy that's a uh, a Windows system admin for a variety of things, and they're having to learn uh, having to learn Linux begrudgingly. I might add, <laughs> but he's not, he's not real enthused with it. He's he's enjoying the learning Aww. experience, but it's kind of like the oh man, you know, I don't want to learn all this crap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, the, see, the search, don't them. the search thing is it's you got it. The search can be really difficult because you got to find one yeah. that does more than prove that you know how to learn on paper. Right. That's I think the key thing. Leo writes in. He says, uh, hi there. There is this little Linux distro that hasn't gotten a lot of attention yet, and it's doing some great work for video, graphical, animation, audio production under Linux. Okay. I thought, okay, this would be good. Could be cool. Talking about Krita and things like that. It's a Linux distro called Open Artist. Uh, Yeah, it takes some of the best software, even the hard-to-install ones, for creativity and puts them all in one place. It's an easy-to-use Linux distro based off Ubuntu 12.04, which will probably update to 14.04 coming soon. The distro can't even be found on DistroWatch, sadly. I'm a hobbyist animator who wants to move all of my work over to Linux when I quit right. school, and so far, Open Artist is my first choice as it has so many advanced tools pre-installed. You can find the distro here at openartisthq.org slash WordPress. Boy, now if only we had an artist in the community that helps run one of our Google Plus uh, communities to help us. Uh, oh, maybe he'd be interested yeah. in this. Yeah. Albert! <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to say, because he would be the man I would go to I wonder if he's for an this. artist perspective, because yeah. I'm. Uh, yeah, I yeah. I can't draw stick figures. That's a good so. point, Matt. That's a good point. Hey, oh. speaking of Coda Radio, I wanted to mention on Monday, that's tomorrow, 9 a.m., noon Eastern. Don't forget yes. about Daylight Savings Time. I won't, trust me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're doing a call in edition on the Mumble Room. So, just yep. like we use for Linux Unplugged, we're doing a call in edition for Coda Radio. If you'd like to call in and chat with us about mm-hmm. certificates, mm-hmm. any mm-hmm. other development related stories, any past things we've covered, we'd love to chat with you on Coda Radio tomorrow morning. So, join us on the Mumble Room. You can get the Mumble server info by joining our chat room and doing Bang Mumble. Yes. And it gives you the server info. That's right. Matt, if you wanted to send folks somewhere on the web. Somewhere th- useful. Where you've been maybe writing and talking about stuff, mm. where would you send them? Well, I think I'd probably start with datamation.com, scroll down to open source, and uh, figure out which my latest article is. It looks like it's uh, XFCE, Beats, KDE, and GNOME. Oh, man, fighting and words. The title was an attention grabber, but I, I do 
point out at the end that there's no right or wrong answer, but at the same time, there's some specific advantages I stand behind. Have you been flamed yet for that title? Oh, big time! But, but <laughs> big time! But but it's but it's been thought. I got really good flames, like a flame that's actually well argued. I will support you. Sure, on sure, sure, absolutely. If you're just being a prick, then no. But I thought you switched you know. to gnome though. I did. On my main desktop, I used gnome, but on the uh, media box, it's XFC oh, sure, sure. because why do I? I don't yeah. need the extra overhead yeah. depositing and whatnot. Yeah. So. You know. I love me some KDE though. So, I tell you, even though I'm you know. using GNOME today, uh, I enjoyed my time in KDE. I just I, I still can't. XFCE care. Just, to yeah. me, I'm gonna have to read. You know what? I will read this tonight because to me, XFCE has Theme gotten it. feel a little old. But I'm thinking, yeah, maybe if you, I if just you haven't theme it up it. proper, yeah. it'll feel good. Okay. If you don't it, out of the box, it makes it's it's ugly. And I addressed that in the article. Okay, so, all right, there yeah. you go. And we'll have a link to that in the show yes. notes if you guys want to read about that. Of course, you can catch both of us on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday. Uh, we have an open lug. That's what we call it, our virtual lug. You can join our mumble room and chat with us about what's on your right. mind. I don't know what we're talking about next week. I have no idea. But we'll last week, we had an interview with two of the Tox developers, TOX, that mm -hmm. new uh, secure mm -hmm. instant messaging application and platform they're working on. You can find that uh, in yeah. Linux Unplugged from last week. Very cool. We'll probably have something great on Tuesday. Undoubtedly. I'm sure. I'm sure. And probably be uh, inspired. beer inspired. Yeah, okay. <laughs> inspired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, just a, last, a couple of last bits of details. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can get a hold of this show by going to Jupiter broadcasting.com turns out click on the contact link choose linux action show from the drop down mm -hmm. easy enough then robots will send it to the correct destination Yeesh. or you can participate in our subreddit linuxactionshow.reddit.com you can vote things up and down and help shape the content of this show over there plus get more stuff than was ever able to fit in this one weekly podcast and by the way you can join us live jblive.tv go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it in your local time zone but we do it at 10 a.m pacific 1 p.m. Eastern. And we do observe daylight savings time. So Unfortunately. There is that. It is in effect right now. Yep. It is in effect. But don't worry about it. The computers will do the math at the calendar That's page. Right. If you have a to, smartphone, you don't care. Go there. Go to yeah. jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. There's also an RSS feed. And if you use Google Calendar, you can just add that sucker That's to right. your calendar. Mm -hmm. It's pretty nice. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Woo! going to be a video of them looking at them but show them your uh yeah there so there you go there's webcam does in fact work um i uh did the green thing here, we go. Here, oh, here you hold it and i'll tilt it yeah, down tilt. there we go so here can you guys see yourselves there you see yourselves what do you look, look at the lights we have to look at huh look at those <laughs> bright lights look at those oh uh, i just saw naked jb viewers back through that webcam that's weird okay my okay. <laughs> 20 years boy <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm ready i'm ready are you ready are you ready, Matt? Are you ready to do the Linux okay. action show? Uh, this here is, uh, I feel all funky because it's too early. I'm all like, it just don't feel uh, comfortable. I'm not, uh, I don't feel comfortable, Matt, but it's all right. Uh, it's, uh, I'll get over it. So I take the kids out to pizza last night, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the little girl has to go potty. Of course. Yeah. So two, uh, uh, two problems uh, arise. Number one, um, you know, should I bring both kids? Right. Yeah, it gets, yeah. Because do exactly. I want to leave one at the table? He really don't. And he yeah. got, he's got multiple phones. And I thought about it for a little bit. And I, you know, I thought, yeah, Dylan's pretty responsible. If it was reversed and I was going to leave Abby, yeah. I, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to bring Abby. True. But I was like, all right, well, and he's in this spot right here. All right, okay, I'll, I'll go for it. So I leave Dylan behind, which is fine. Yeah. That went fine. However, then I start approaching the bathroom. You see, the problem you have when you have to take the, the little girl to the bathroom is, you know, it's weird if you go in the guy's bathroom, but it's very weird if I go in the lady's bathroom. So, of course, I got to go in the guy's bathroom. Oh, yeah. No, it's by default. Yeah. yeah. The parents' gender dictates but, where right. you're going. But and then, you know, you open the door and you always just have that, that brief moment. Like, what right. is she about to see? What is she? Right. Are we about to have I, a conversation afterwards? What's yeah. going to happen in here? Yeah. It went smooth, though. Nothing, That's good. Yeah. That's good. But that was a moment. <laughs> so we're going to do a little uh, pre- uh, It's all pre about planning your bad way. Pre yeah. Well, I just, yeah, exactly. Pl I plan around the gut the gut pain. <laughs> so this, uh, I don't know if any of you beer is, beer is Tasty fans remember, but a long time ago, one of our favorites was the uh, Kirkland. Yes. The Kirkland Signature Beers. Kirkland I know that sounds as crazy. in Costco? Yes. Wow. Costco okay. got into the beer brewing. Uh, this is a uh, the handcrafted amber ale. It has a coppery brown with rich malty character. This perfectly brewed amber ale gets its good looks from the dark roasted crystal malt that we import from England to give it some Western flair. It's moderately hopped with hops straight from Yakima Valley in Washington. The Unix operating system that was a is thing basically too. made up of three parts. The kernel or operating system proper is the part that manages the mm. control of the machine mm. and supervises scheduling Jeez. of the various user programs. 
the shell, or which is the name we give to the command mm -hmm. interpreter, looks after the communication between the user and, that's a user and the system itself. And the third part, which is actually the largest, <laughs> is the various utility programs, which perform specific tasks like editing a file, or sorting a bunch of numbers, or uh, making a plot. Uh, in other words, all the other programs that are not provided directly as part of the operating system kernel. One of the things about Unix... There you go, you just got it from Dennis himself. The man Jeez. knows what he's talking no about. No kidding. Captain's log, start at 215-76-631-728476. Oh, yeah. Okay. I accidentally the whole thing. Yeah, I, I agree with the, uh, the, the chat room on that. The star dates have to... I could never understand the whole... I, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. They're talking well, that's because in, the, in TOS, I don't do they didn't mean though. anything. And it wasn't until TNG that they started meaning something. Uh, okay. So it kind of throws you for a loop a little bit. Well, you're I mean, all like, but either way, I still have no idea because I never actually bothered to research. You're all like, hey, girl, I don't understand your star dates. And it's all like, hey, y'all. I honestly spent more time studying Klingon pickup lines than I did, you know, that. Doc, 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 doc. I mean, because, you know, you like flip a table and throw your bat lift upside someone's head. And you're, next thing you know, you're married. I don't know. It's weird. That is true. It's that is how, That is exactly how it works, Matt. Remember the uh, the the Wharf Jack Sia thing on the um, you know on their the whole marriage thing like how their that yeah. the whole wedding ceremony. Yeah. I always thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah I, don't I could know. never get my wife to do a whole reenactment on that though. She kind of gave me a blank look. I it's was like, never oh. huge into the uh, into the romance stuff when I was watching T or any of the Star Trek. I wasn't but. huge into the romance stuff, but I found it. I, I felt like it finally injected just a touch of testosterone in it. If, you know, you got a, you, know, you got some yeah a little yeah. little something to it versus yeah. a lot of. I'll the, tell you this. I'll put it to you this way. I sure liked that a lot more than I liked Vic Fontaine. Or just, oh, God, yeah, he needed to be lit on fire. Just, no, I, I did not watch Star Trek for singing, okay? No. And, and then, like... Well, and it took time away from Quark's bar, which, both, which bothered exactly. me. Exactly! Yes. You already have a bar! Yeah. And you have a really good yes. atmosphere. You got Odo, you got Quark, you exactly. got freaking uh, What's-His-Face with the three what are you? What are you giving Quark yeah. when you do that? What right. are you giving Quark? You're giving Quark crap. Right. You're and, crapping on Quark. Quark. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. We'll see you right back here next week. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and with a bang. Oh.